20 years ago, I was reflecting that 20 years ago, I came to Calgary for one of my first times, and I came here, and I, there's this thing called candidating, where I was just checking out the church, and uh, I wasn't sure about this church. I was like, ah, oh, I don't know if I want to work here, you know? This is, this is uh, not a lot of people are actually talking to me. People are uh, shy or mean, and then there's this one little girl, I think her name was Joanne Vo, and she like... I was just outside, right outside those steps there, and this little girl came up to me and said, hi, how are you? And I was just like, oh, someone's talking to me finally. So I talked to her, and I realized it was her dad who gave me a ride here, and, and I, was, I was like, oh, this is actually very welcoming, talking to a child <laughs> at that time. And I just felt welcome, and I decided then, you know what, this, this actually is a good church. And I started talking to more people. I think she broke the ice for other people to talk to me, and then I think all the youth had more uh, courage. But this was one of the places that God brought me to in my spiritual journey. Uh, it was right after Bible school, and uh, I, now I find myself as an international worker in Cambodia. Uh, we we use, use, use the term missionary. That, that term uh, is not used so much uh, for certain reasons, so we now in, use the international worker. But I'm here with my family. I'm now married. I have, uh, my wife, Carol, just took Mackenzie downstairs, I think, and uh, my son, Marcus, is here. I have a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old, uh, so this is wild to come here to Calgary again. Uh, we are here for our one-year furlough. We've been in Cambodia for four years, and so one place we had to come to is Calgary to visit a lot of old friends, uh, and I see a lot of old friends here. Uh, two weeks ago, I did my pilgrimage to this place called the Calgary Stampede, um, and it was, I had to go because I have kids now, right? And I wanted to show them all the fun I used to have. And it was, Stampede's very different now. But I, I ended up going on that, I, I like deals, so I, I go, went on that free day that you can go before a certain time. And I didn't know a lot of other people have that same idea. So I went there and I stood in line to get these tickets. And have you ever bought tickets at the Stampede before? I didn't know on this day, apparently this day is the worst day to line up. So I stood in line for an hour to get these tickets. And I thought, oh man, this, these rides don't even look worth it, but we're just going to go buy these tickets. So an hour later, we got these tickets. And then we said, okay, someone said the line up for the rides will be quick. And they lied to me. And so we stood in this one line because my kids said, okay, let's go on this ride. We can go on it as a family. It's some roller coaster one or something like that, um, crazy mouse or something. And so we, we went on this lineup, and we thought, okay, it's going to take about half an hour. After an hour of lining up, I thought, okay, this is going to be, shouldn't be that bad. But man, about an hour into that lineup, we're like, we're like, oh, we're just around the halfway point. And it's that point where you wonder, should I leave? I've spent, I've invested so much time into this technically ride. This ride would eat up half our tickets we just bought too. So we're like, oh, do we just go or not? And I'm like, oh, let's just put 20 more minutes into it. And then you're like, oh. And it's at this point I ask myself the question that almost any parent would ask himself is, why am I doing this? <laughs> why am I here in another line looking at the time? I'm over two hours in line. We just got here and already it's close to lunchtime. And we're like, why? And this fundamental question, I mean, people, philosophers have been asking the question of life. Why do we live? Why do we have this, these things? Why do we do what we do? And I think this is a very good time to ask why, because the why leads us to our intentions. And I had to question, what are my intentions of being in this line right now? Like, do I want to look like an awesome dad? Do I want to be like, oh, my dad took me on this cool ride? Am I actually just going for my kids' enjoyment? Do they really want to go on this ride? Do I want to go on this ride? And I, I crossed that one off right away. That's not my intention. I don't really want to go on this ride. I've been on many rides before. This one didn't seem that awesome, but I thought, okay, we could go on it together as a family. And then I thought, okay, actually, that's the reason. My intention is to do this as a family. You know, I wanted to do something we can all fit in this cart together and risk our lives on this ride. And so we, we, we did this, and I, but I still had this thing in my mind, like, is this worth it? You know, it was close to three hours when we finally got on this ride. We whipped around for about 70 seconds, and 
And I thought, wow, I really don't know if it was worth it. <laughs> Until my daughter said to me, can we go on again? <laughs> yeah. Oh. So in, in a sense, I realized that at that, that point was actually worth it. She actually had joy. But my intentions needed to be analyzed. It is a question of why that can change our lives. It can change the trajectory of our lives. And when we are dare to ask these questions of why, we are seeking our intentions. Why, why do you do what you do? Why do you go to the school that you go to? Why, do you, why are you in the relationship you're in right now? Like, what are your intentions? Why do I want to make money? In the Bible, I actually want to go to a passage. And if you want on screen, can you put up the Acts 16 passage? Acts 16, 16. You can open the Bible more and actually look at the context because this is about Paul and Silas visiting an, an area. And I want to read this passage to you. I think we got NIV up there. Paul came to dirt. Sorry, I'm not sure. First one. Uh, verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face authorities. God, this passage has confused many, and as we dissect this a little bit, and as we go into a question of why, may you change our hearts, may you open our hearts to, to be modified by you. Speak to us from your word. Amen. Amen. This passage is a passage that... Uh, you have to wonder why. What is going on here? Paul and Silas are in one of their favorite cities. I don't know if it's their favorite because they got arrested later on. But it was their favorite church, Philippi. And he's at this church area. And one of the first things they do is they preach in the synagogues. They preach in the areas that they can go to. And, and they're proclaiming Jesus. They actually have one main intention. Their intention here is to make Jesus known. They weren't going for fame or they're not even going for their own popularity. They are going to make him famous. And they're doing that by healing people in the name of Jesus. Teaching people in the name of Jesus. That's their intention. They actually had rules about how they would interact with people in churches. They wouldn't accept money for themselves. They would accept food. They would accept shelter. They would accept money for other churches. But they themselves did not go at it for personal gain. And you would think that Paul and Silas loved that this woman was following her. Them, they're, they're, she's screaming, hey, look, these guys are, what does it say exactly? They're followers, they're servants of the Most High God, and they're telling you the way to be saved. You would think they'd like this. But Paul and Silas knew the evil intentions behind this. This woman was actually quite annoying. It said it went on for a few days. So they put up for, with it for a while. And the Spirit praised Paul and Silas, but it was not for God's glory. It was not for promoting Jesus. This woman actually praised Paul and Silas and pointed the finger to them because this person was making money, fortune-telling. And they get a cut. They get a cut of this. They're like riding on the coattails of Paul and Silas. This was a business opportunity. You know, this is like when I, I went to a, a, a trip to the Caribbean, and uh, actually I went to Cuba with my wife when we didn't have kids, and I, had, well, I did a touristy thing, not very smart. I, t I pulled out a map, you know, in the middle of Cuba, and of course, one guy comes up to us and says, hey, what are you looking for? And I said, oh, I'm looking for this place, and he goes, oh, I can take you there. I said, oh, this is really nice and very helpful, and he takes us there around the corner, and we get there, and then he does this to us, and I'm like, oh. No, I got duped, you know? This, this guy didn't actually care about me or, you know, this is just him trying to make money off the tourist industry and he just saw uh, the Asian tourist with a, a map, you know? And, and he just wanted that little bit. And that's what this spirit is out. This is looking for a business opportunity. We can get more money. We don't know much about this woman. We don't know the history of her, but we know that she's a slave for these businessmen. 
and she has an evil spirit inside of her that they're using to for, tell the future, fortune telling. We don't know if she's a good fortune teller. We just know that this spirit can read other things, read spirits, and predict some things. But she made her master money. But I know this, spiritual spirits can see spirits. So no doubt that this spirit inside of her saw the spirit of Christ in Paul and Silas. This spirit recognized power. And this spirit, I would call it like a spirit of greed. The spirit of greed within this woman. You know, and it's, it had evil intentions. The spirit, evil spirits always want to separate people from God. It's kind of ironic. The spirit's pointing people towards Paul and Silas, not because to make Jesus famous, but to make those people famous, to make us famous. Let's, make, let's have a business deal. Let's make money in this whole thing. We, must, we have to be careful of swindling spirits. I've met people with swindling spirits before, pastors who are promoting health and wealth. I've met pastors and seen many pastors making millions off the backs of others, spiritual leaders with jets or like uh, living luxurious lifestyles while their constituents suffer. You have to be careful of people like this who are, who are wolf in sheep's clothing. And then Paul and Silas are fed up. They cast this greedy spirit this selfish spirit out of this woman, and this woman is free. And all of a sudden, the, the business owners realize they lost their uh, income here. The intention of the spirit is always is to pull people away from Christ. But the intention of Paul and Silas is to point people to Jesus. And we all have intentions. We all have intentions when we do things. You know, I remember when I, I met my, my wife's parents for the first time. I... You know, have you, have you ever met your fiancé or your girlfriend's parents for the first time or your fiancé's parents? And you put on this perfect attitude. You try to look good, right? You, you do your hair in a way that you don't usually do it. I started, like, I started doing things I don't usually do at people's houses. I started doing dishes, you know, just to show that, hey. I started, like, talking to them more, showing interest in them. But my intention was to, for the parents to like me. Actually, that was my secondary intention. My primary intention was, I want to marry your daughter. So that's the primary intention. The secondary, any secondary intention that completes intention number one, I'll do that. You know, like there's, there's a level of it, right? And my secondary intentions had to be there, done well. You know, and I, I think it worked. Um, but my, but some people like playing soccer, you know, like. But I, on my so I play soccer with a whole bunch of people in uh, Koreans in uh, in, uh, in Cambodia and Khmer Cambodians, and we all have different intentions for playing. And it, it, some people get angry on the soccer field because they really want to be the star. You know, when they play, they want to score ten goals. If they don't score ten goals, it's a horrible day for them. And that's their intention to score goals and and be popular. My intention is to not die in the field. I just want to exercise, get this thing moving, you know, so I don't die. Some people actually want to play for fun. I don't know. I don't understand those people. They just want to play for fun, you know. But I just want to survive. Some people play for fun. Some people want to do it to, like, be really popular. There's other people who actually want to make a living out of this, you know. They, they really are aiming at skill. They're aiming at wanting to be excellent. We can all do the same thing but have different intentions. We can, some people... I know it's one guy I played with. All he wants to do is impress his wife all the time. He just wants to, every time he does something good, he looks at her, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, oh, I used to be like that. Now I'm just trying to survive, though. I'm trying not to get a heart attack on the field, you know? I don't mind playing. I don't even mind playing. I don't have to play the whole game. Like, I'll get off and say, I need a rest, you know? Like, that's me. Some guys want to play the entire time. We have different intentions when we do things. And I think we need to ask ourselves these questions all the time. Like, even if you're worship leading, why are you the worship leading? These are questions. What are your intentions for worship leading? Why, why do we sing? Why do we come to church? Or why am I even reading the Bible? These questions need to be asked. They're excellent questions. Why do I serve God? I call this like a heart check. When you really got to examine your heart and figure out, why am I doing this? Check our intentions. Do I preach because I want to be a good speaker? 
this is, this is a real, let me get real. This is, this is church, so this is a confession time, okay? Um, why do I preach? Often, many times I'm thinking, I want people to like me, you know? Or why do I do things I do? Do I want it to make Jesus popular and famous? Or do I preach because I want to be known as a good speaker? I have to ask myself that. Did I go to Cambodia to serve God? Or did I go to make a name for myself? Or did I go for, for different reasons? I have to ask myself these questions regularly. If I'm honest, and I did some reflection on this, I, I even met with a counselor to talk about it, but if I reflect on my five years of serving here at this church, um, back when it was Calgary Vietnamese Mennonite Church, I want, if I reflect and be honest, this is solely confession, I didn't even plan to do this, but I just wanted to be a good pastor. My priority, my intention was to be a good pastor. And that's actually not the best intention for pastoring. You know, yes, you can care for people, but my, that was misaligned. I was straight out of Bible school, and forgive me for, for having this, but I, my intention was not that wholesome. And it, and it came out like this. And you may have heard about me before, because I'm popular this way. I have an anger issue, all right? And anger comes out when things don't go my way, all right? So this is like, um, this is like, a child, you know, not getting your way. Have you ever seen a child not get their way? Have you ever seen a 25-year-old act out when they don't get their way? Yeah, some of you have seen 50-year-olds act out. Yeah. Well, I was like a 25-year-old that did not get my way, and when I don't get my way, I would get angry. And I have to. This is my sincere apology. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to the people that were here with me. I did horrible things in my anger. I, got, I lashed out at someone because... My intention was to do, let's say it was to do a good service. And if uh, someone did something wrong, I would actually get upset at them because I thought that was a reflection on me. Does that make sense to you? Kind of make sense? It really didn't make sense to me for a while. That's, I'm, I'm summing up years of therapy in one minute, all right? So, but, that, but that's me taking things and getting angry. And I, I really do ask for your forgiveness. You know, I've done some many heart checks in my life, and there are barriers to even the best intentions. You know, that we can put up these barriers. There are spiritual barriers. You know, you may want to, let's say I, I sometimes wanted to talk to a stranger, but the cultural aspects are like, oh, but we don't talk to strangers in this culture. You know, we don't just go up to people and talk to people about Jesus. That's not culturally appropriate. Or society wouldn't like that I do these things. You may have the highest intentions to serve God in a new way, but there's spiritual barriers. There's shyness even there. There's, there's things that doubt in your own mind that says, I'm not good enough. And we have to make sure that we pray that these barriers will not get in the way of our intentions. In Cambodia, there's a lot of ministries that my wife are involved in. And I, I don't want to, we don't want to actually say what we do in Cambodia. We'll get to that. You can read our blog about that. But we want to go into the why we do it. Like we, we, we moved around halfway around the world to this country right beside Vietnam because we wanted to serve God. And, and we wanted to, to see, well, God, where, where do you want to use us? I want to invite my wife up here now. Is there a mic that she can use? Can she use yellow? Oh, she got it. She got it already. You guys are so ready. Um, but I want her to share about, about some individuals that we've met that have great intentions for serving God. And if you can turn the slide to that, I think it's slide number six. Yeah, thank you. Testing, can you hear me? Um, thanks. Yeah, I would really love to just share about one of our Christian Vietnamese Cambodian leaders. She's Vietnamese ethnically, but born in Cambodia. And during the COVID, um, when COVID finally hit Cambodia and there was an outbreak, one of the things that the government did was set up these uh, medical facilities. So if you tested positive, you had to go there, no matter, uh, d didn't matter if you were mild or you had a severe case. So these places were quite crowded. There was limited healthcare workers and equipment, and it was just rows and rows of hundreds of metal, like beds for each patient. So one of our leaders, um, her grandma con contracted COVID. She's in her 90s, and 
all of her family members said, you know, just let grandma go to the facility to die. Because um, you, you could also have a family member go with you to take care of you in these uh, facilities. And she just felt like God was telling her, no, you need to go take care of grandma. Um, this woman is in her 50s, and she has seven kids of her own. So it was a big sacrifice for her to leave her own family to take care of her grandma. But when she was in the facility, um, she constantly kept in touch with us and asked for prayer requests and was sharing these amazing God stories of what, um, how God was using her. So she faithfully went. You know, when, when you are in these facilities, you basically have to take care of yourself. So she was feeding grandma, changing her bedding, bathing her. Um, she had to go look for, like, oxygen tanks and drag it across the room to bring for grandma at times. Um, but she also saw that there was a lot of need there. There were other, many other patients who did not have any family members taking care of them. And so she began to become Jesus' hands and feet. She was um, feeding other patients, cleaning other patients, um, bringing oxygen tanks to other patients, people, strangers that she didn't know. And then she began to share um, the gospel with them. And after spending about three weeks in this COVID center, we heard stories of patients on their deathbed that was praying prayers of repentance and recognizing that uh, Jesus died for them and they accepted Christ as their savior. Um, there were people who recovered and she still keeps in touch with them. Cambodian patients who um, often in Cambodian society, they look down on Vietnamese people as being poor, lowly, uneducated. So this woman became her friend because she showed love and kindness to them. And she continues to build friendships and share the gospel with them. There were many family members that constantly call her to thank her for the love and kindness that she showed their family members in the center. And this was just one way that one of our disciples, we were just so... Um, inspired to hear how she was showing Christ's love in tangible ways during a very difficult time and sac sacrificing herself. But she was empowered by the Holy Spirit. She was constantly telling me how, um, I guess it wasn't, she didn't grow weary. She just asked for prayer, but Christ was working through her, empowering her, telling her who to talk to, who to care for. And, she, when, and grandma recovered from COVID in her 90s and went home healthy. And we were just, yeah, really, really glad that we could support her in that way and that she can continue to share her testimony. Thank you, Carol. <coughs> Another... Thing that we're doing in Cambodia. We, we well, I walked into Cambodia with open arms asking God, what do you want us to do here? We don't want to come in with preconceived ideas that we're going to do this and th do that. <coughs> Can I get my water in my back backpack, actually? Um, and one of the things that we discerned was God was telling us to, to help with the financial problem in Cambodia. And one of our intentions is to help people out of poverty, but not just poverty, just debt there's a de spiritual debt problem there and so we're, we're working on that but i think our we do need to ask ourselves regularly why do we do this why are we serving what is our primary intention what is god putting on your heart you know paul is very clear on his on his reason why he says this in romans and he says in Romans 9, 1 to 3, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit I, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish, this is weird. I've never, you never hear anyone say this, but I wish, I could, I wish that my myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He would rather him Paul would rather be cut off from God so that other people will know Christ. You know, that's just a sacrifice. This is a sacrificial heart. His intention is that people are saved, that Jesus is known. So how do we apply this today? I really, 
and not just simply asking why. Like, you ever see those workouts, there's a low impact and a high impact? So I'm gonna give you the low impact first, right? This is a low impact application. If you're, if you're new to the faith or you're not yet believing in Christ, you, you need to ask yourself, I want you to ask yourself, how, how can you serve God? You know, how can you be a light every day for, your, for, for God's glory? We're not asking for heart surgery. Sometimes we ask those high impact questions like, yeah, God changed my heart. But that's like heart surgery. That's, that's, that's high impact. Low impact, just say, God, what do you want me to do? You know, I see someone in need right now, or I see someone that is lonely. God, what should I do? Just ask these questions, you know, when, when, you're, when you're thinking about what you should be involved with, you know. Ask the Holy Spirit. This is a prayer. It's a prayer in the name of Jesus' name to the Spirit. Spirit, empower me. Just what do you want me to do? You know, like, I heard someone asking, saying they need someone help here. I heard, heard there's an area to serve in that area. Just ask, what are you going to do? The high impact is the heart, is, the, is what I was talking about before. It's heart surgery. Is asking the hard question. You know, Paul wished to be a substitute, to take the cursing so that others would know Jesus. This is not just a cognitive decision you make. This is a heart transformation. It is a transformation that is, is, will, have, will change your life. It will change the trajectory of your life. You know, the, word, the spirit can change your heart. If you ask God, the high impact is, God, please change my heart. We sang a song earlier about pour out my heart, but actually, yeah, pour it out of all the goodness. And Lord, change what's inside of me, that I'm not just going to be doing the same thing and over and over again. But God, change me so that I would want to do something with full intentions, that will lead to the right intentions. That I would, I would know Jesus in a personal way. Then I would help others know him. What can you do? What kind of questions do we want to ask yourself so that your intentions are more clear? How can the spirit change your heart and reveal truth to you? Like, isn't that what sanctification is? It's this whole work of being renewed in Christ. How can you serve God from a holy perspective and not just from our own lowly perspective. I'm finding myself questioning this all the time. I, I'm in a time when I'm back home to question even why am I, do I go back to Cambodia? Do I continue serving in different ways? We always need to ask ourselves these questions. Don't get stagnant doing the same thing. You, did you know you can get stagnant serving God? doing the same thing you can't over and over again in the same spot, you know? And that's actually not growing, you know? <laughs> Our bodies physically stop growing after a time. Well, some of it grows this way, but this way we stop growing. But in our spiritual life, we need to continue growing. But sometimes we get stuck. And it's at these critical moments God is calling us to examine why are we doing this. If you look at the loss in the world, if you look at the injustices all around the world, there is need. There, your heart, if you look at the world and your heart does not bleed, there's something wrong there. But if God's pushing a little sensitivity there, saying, look, there's a lot of people that don't know me yet. If God's saying through his spirit that he wants you to help out and serve, then you might need to start listening to that now and ask why. What are my intentions? I want to pray for you all right now. Let me, Father God, we come to church, some of us out of habit, some of us out of ritual, some of it out of uh, a desire to know your word and fellowship. And Lord, some of, all these things are great, but Lord, I pray that, Lord, you will be glorified. I pray that primarily your name will be made known and you're, you're, you will be able to touch people's lives, touch our lives, touch our hearts, tickle it, change it, for the mature believers in this room, Lord, we pray that, Lord, that you really do a dynamic shift. Allow them to think beyond themselves. 
Allow them to examine the intentions of the past and inten current intentions, and of course of the future. So I lift up my brothers and sisters up to you now. In the name that makes all things possible, the name of Jesus Christ, amen.